Hi, it's Mr. Ramage, and this video lesson is going to take you through the events leading up to the start of the very famous Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. In 1925, the city of Dayton, Tennessee was the site of a great showdown between science and religion. In truth, it was nothing more than an attempt to increase tourism and an effort to put the city of Dayton on the map. The trial may not have been precisely what the city hoped for, but it did gain national attention as the debate between religion and science raged in the United States. This video will examine the events leading up to the trial of the century, and to do that, we need to start a few hundred years before it actually happens. Let's start with the science. The age of reason and the dawn of the Industrial Revolution had begun to change the world drastically, as society moved toward a more scientific and logical view of the world and the entire universe for that matter. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution challenged the belief that God had created man and replaced it with millions of years of evolution, adaptation, and change. In 1959, Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, stated that, the view which most naturalists entertain, and which I formerly entertained, namely, that each species has been independently created, is erroneous. And in his second book, The Descent of Man, published in 1871, Darwin stated that, man is descended from a hairy, tailed quadruped, probably arboreal in its habits, and an inhabitant of the old world. Darwin's theories were certainly controversial, but by the early 1900s, they had begun to find their way into textbooks, not only at the collegiate level, but in high school biology textbooks like A Civic Biology, published in 1914, which described evolution as, quote, the belief that simple forms of life on Earth slowly and gradually gave rise to those more complex, and that thus ultimately, the most complex forms came into existence. This passage comes from the textbook that John Scopes will claim to have used to teach students in violation of the Butler Act. Now, onto the religious side of the case. Fundamentalist Christianity was on the rise in America as a reaction to a lot of changes taking place that worried, upset, and downright terrified millions of people. America's rapid industrialization and urbanization had brought millions of immigrants to the U.S., bringing with them new cultures, ethnicities, languages, and religions to a predominantly Protestant white nation. New technologies had changed life in urban areas. Automobiles allowed young people more freedom and independence than any generation had ever had before. Women were working and voting, as well as changing their dress and hairstyles and breaking from tradition. The country looked very different in 1925 than it had even at the turn of the century. During the 1910s, fundamentalism gained popularity in the U.S. as a reaction to all of this change and the belief that liberalism had permeated the nation. Funded by oil barons Lyman and Milton Stewart, Evangelist A.C. Dixon commissioned a series of 90 essays to combat religious liberalism and promote fundamentalist beliefs in the literal truth of the Bible and claimed that modernism was the enemy of religion. The former Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who will later find himself in Dayton, Tennessee, became one of the unofficial leaders of the fundamentalist movement, giving speeches in 1921 titled The Menace of Darwinism and The Bible and Its Enemies. And in 1924, his speech titled Is the Bible True? was copied and distributed to members of the Tennessee legislature, including one Mr. John Butler, head of the World Christian Fundamentalist Association. One year later, Butler introduced legislation that would prohibit the teaching of, quote, any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Later on, Butler had the following to say concerning the origins of the bill. I didn't know anything about evolution. I'd read in the papers that boys and girls were coming home from school and telling their fathers and mothers that the Bible was all nonsense. 
The Butler Bill was signed by Tennessee Governor Austin Pay, making Tennessee the first state to ban the teaching of evolution. William Jennings Bryan himself praised Governor Pay and the law, stating that, quote, the Christian parents of the state owe you a debt of gratitude for saving their children from the poisonous influence of an unproven hypothesis. Now, despite signing the bill, the governor did not believe that the law would really be enforced or interrupt the education of Tennessee's students. The American Civil Liberties Union, which had formed in 1920 to protect the constitutional rights of all Americans, wanted to challenge the Butler Act and needed a teacher willing to stand trial for breaking the law. The ACLU put out articles in Tennessee newspapers stating that they were looking for a Tennessee teacher who was willing to accept our services in testing this law in the courts. Our lawyers think a friendly test case can be arranged without costing a teacher his or her job. All we need now is a willing client. And it just so happens that that willing client was John T. Scopes, a 24-year-old science teacher and football coach in Butler, Tennessee. Scopes had just wrapped up his first year of teaching and originally planned to return to Kentucky for the summer, but stayed a little longer hoping to get a date with the, quote, beautiful blonde. Scopes was approached by a group of community leaders from Dayton, including George Replaya, local manager for the Cumberland Coal and Iron Company, as well as Superintendent Walter White. No, 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 not that Walter White. This Walter White, Superintendent of Dayton Schools, and local attorney Sue Hicks. This group was interested in using the law and the trial to bring some much needed tourism and publicity to the small town of Dayton. Scopes, who had been a substitute teacher in the science class that used the textbook containing evolution, could not exactly recall ever directly teaching it to his class, but agreed to stand trial, and on May 25, 1925, was indicted by a grand jury for violating the Butler Act. Just a few days before Scopes' indictment by the grand jury, William Jennings Bryan agreed to assist in the prosecution of the case, despite not having tried a case himself in 36 years. But his addition to the team of prosecutors guaranteed that the trial would get the public attention the city leaders of Dayton so desperately wanted. After originally declining, famous Chicago lawyer Clarence Darrow agreed to serve on the defense team. According to Darrow, there was no limit to the mischief that might be accomplished unless the country was aroused to the evil at hand. Well, the city was up to quite the mischief in preparation for the trial. In the weeks leading up to the trial, six blocks of the town are converted into a pedestrian mall. Speaker platforms are erected outside of the courthouse, which was wired with the latest technology to broadcast the trial to the nation and to the world. Newspaper men from across the country flooded the town and supporters of both sides of the argument arrived to defend their belief in the Bible or in Darwin. There were even trained monkeys on display. Part two of this video will explore the trial itself as well as its aftermath and impact on America, religion, education, and beyond. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned something.